Hey everybody, welcome to the Single Tracks Podcast. My name is Jeff, and today Matt and I are going to be talking about our and your least useful mountain bike innovations. Thanks for joining us. So, uh, I'm the one that came up with this topic. Um, and if you're a listener of the show, you know that I'm pretty much like a glass half full kind of guy. And so, yeah, I phrased it as the, the least useful. Some people read it as the most useless innovations. Matt, do <laughs> you think there are any uh, mountain bike innovations that are just like totally useless? No, I mean, I wouldn't say totally useless. I, yeah, I mean, I think at face value, a lot of them seem totally useless, but um, <laughs> I think at least all of them are at least rooted in some reason. Yeah. Yep. For sure. Right. I mean, nobody is coming up with stuff like just to become a coming up with stuff. It solves a problem. And what's interesting is, I mean, obviously we all ride different types of bikes and different trails and we have different styles. And so, I mean, while there probably is some stuff that like I have no use for, uh, other people do, you know, like a road bike, I have no use for a road bike. <laughs> give me a gravel bike, give me a mountain bike, but yeah. Yeah, not to say that there isn't uh, bad design out there, stuff that comes and, and fades away because it was thought out poorly, but even those have some merit behind them or or some, right. uh, some value somewhere. Yeah, exactly. So um, again, you know, I came up with this survey and filled in the choices. You know, it's like a, one of these, you select a choice kind of survey. You can only select one. Um, and so I had to come up with a list of choices. I think I came up with about a dozen things kind of off the top of my head. Um, and I threw in, to be honest, I threw in a few like zingers in there to hopefully like <laughs> get people talking or, you know, thinking about things a little more. Um, and so anyway, there was a great discussion on the website in the comments section um, and a ton of people voted. You know, it's still, uh, it's been more than a week since we ran that survey, I believe, um, or maybe it's just been a week, but we're still getting tons of new yeah. comments and, you know, preparing for this conversation. I kept like adding to the list, like, oh, somebody else had a really good comment. So, um, yeah, why don't we go through the list of some of the top things that, that people picked and yeah, kind of unpack that a little bit. So the first uh, top thing that got the most votes was electronic suspension controls uh, as being like a not super useful innovation in a lot of people's opinion. Um, and for those who don't know, you know, electronic suspension control is Fox Live Valve. Um, that one's been out for a while. And now RockShox has Flight Attendant, which kind of does the same thing. The idea is that um, your suspension is electronically controlled and, you know, can uh, react to the terrain and, and do lots of fancy stuff. You've tested uh, Live Valve, haven't you, Matt? Yes, yes. The first rendition, um, which was back at a uh, pivot camp for one of their XC bikes uh, a couple mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah, yeah. What did you think? Was it Was it helpful? Yeah, I mean, it's cool. Um, there were a lot of people that had nitpicks with, uh, I think it was mainly the sensitivity of the suspension and mm -hmm. um, it didn't necessarily feel like uh, if you had run the same Fox equipment without the sensors and mm. automatic controls and everything, but it's definitely amazing technology. I mean, the fact yeah. that, you know, for so long, um, mountain bikers have, you know, been flipping the little levers on their suspension, you know, firm it up and they go up a climb and, mm -hmm. and then remember to open it up and you go on a descent and it's cool technology. I suppose I struggle to see the use of it as suspension kinematics improve. Um, mm. I don't know if you're in the same camp, but I mean, I rarely ever firm up my suspension unless I'm right. like, you know, riding on a road or something like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. I mean, right. It's solving. I mean, it's interesting because right. A lot of us don't even do it like, 
but then that makes me wonder like, well, maybe I should be like, like maybe if I were more diligent about like locking and unlocking or, you know, switching modes, I would have a better ride, but yeah, it's interesting. I guess because like I prioritize the descent and like kinematics lately, I mean, they're just, they're really, really good. It doesn't necessarily work the same way in a fork where you know, if you stand up and sprint, you're still kind of mushing into the fork. But with mm -hmm. uh, rear suspension, it's gotten so good, and like just this great balance of traction and efficiency that I rarely ever, even on climbs, because I would rather have the traction, um, mm -hmm. I rarely ever firm up my suspension. Um, I'd rather just leave it open and forget about it. And unless the bike is just really kind of mushy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I don't, I feel like maybe I've ridden a bike with it, but, um, but the fact that I don't remember just proves that like, maybe it wasn't super memorable or it wasn't <laughs> super helpful. Um, so yeah, that's one. And it, like you said though, it's still early. Like the one live valve that you tested, that was a few years ago. Um, but it's still mm -hmm. kind of early days in that and like trying to dial it in and figure out how, or if it can lead to an advantage. Um, yeah, I think that's, it's probably where we're at with that. So yeah, not surprising that a lot of people said that that wasn't super useful or relevant for them right now. Yeah. And, and RockShox just came out with theirs last summer, I believe. And, mm -hmm. you know, also the, uh, another thing worth noting is that it does these things that mountain bikers have always had to think about themselves, but it's mm -hmm. also like an extra two grand if you want to add to your bike. So, <laughs> right. um, yeah, I don't know if I'd say the least useful, and I think this applies to the top two, but maybe the least necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. The value is, is maybe not there too, right? So yeah, it's got to be, for that price, it better be super useful and like, yeah, just totally change how the bike rides because, yeah, I mean, that's 2000 bucks is upgrading from like a decent bike to a really nice bike, you know, so... Yeah, it's right. got to deliver. Carbon wheels or a really nice fork. Yeah, yep. So yeah, looking at the next uh, most popular response, electronic shifting, it would seem like mountain bikers aren't into electronics. I don't know, is that is that your takeaway? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, again, it's, well, it really seems like this is where the industry is heading is more electronics. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just everywhere in our daily lives is more electronics right. everything everything has to be charged and i mean i get tired of having to charge everything that's not on my bike as well and so i don't know i wouldn't call myself a, a luddite but it does add another layer of complication onto preparing your bike for a ride okay mm -hmm. now i've got to think about charging my derailleur battery um so yeah it's it, again i think one of the less necessary innovations mm -hmm. though it is cool and in in my experience like works really well yeah yeah i mean i guess part of it you know bikes for so long have been analog completely you know no electronics nothing electrical even and to go to this is a big change for a lot of people like a lot of people maybe they're drawn to mountain bikes because they're you know pretty simple machines and so yeah, it's not surprising that there's pushback and people are saying, well, bikes don't need that. I mean, we love bikes without that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we we don't really need it. But um, and I'm one of those, you know, years ago when Shimano came out with uh, the DI2 yeah. um, technology for for mountain bikes. And, you know, I was trying to understand, like, OK, what like what is the value that this adds or, you know, does this make something better? And, you know you could probably go back and look at my comments. They're probably still on the site, you know, on the forums back in the day when people would talk about a lot of stuff on the forums or in comments, you know, I, I'm sure I wrote like, this is not that useful. Like this is not something mm -hmm. that I see myself needing. Um, but I would say maybe I'm coming around on it. Like, you know, I've been using, uh, been riding a bike with access on it, SRAM's uh, wireless electronic sh shifting system. And, it's pretty nice. Like it feels good. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I can see a lot of the value in it in terms of like, 
it's just easier to set up and the the shifts feel more crisp and you know i the one argument i even would make fun of was like oh well people would say oh it's just easier like you, know, you don't have to press the lever so hard you can just kind of tap the button and i always laughed at that and was like what like how hard is it to yeah. press a lever but but it actually feels a lot easier like you don't have to take your your thumb off the bar as much you know to shift and i don't know yeah it feels nice so i don't know i and i think it'll get better too like the electronic suspension so i don't know if i would put it in the the least useful category right it, there are definitely advantages um if you think about well one tuning is theoretically much simpler since you're not experiencing cable stretch over mm -hmm. um over time and getting it in sync is better i've had it on a couple test bikes over the course of a couple months and it's always worked great and when it like started um shifting poorly and i was like all right what the heck's going on it's more <laughs> of an issue that the derailleur uh had come unthreaded from the hanger a little bit and oh. it was as simple as like making sure it was threaded back in um yeah but there's certainly advantages i even if you look at the um axis gx eagle and the feel of the shifting compared to mechanical like it mm -hmm. feels like it shifts quicker for yeah you know the same model name on it um yep yeah, I mean, do you feel like your do you have the GX and the Evil you're testing? No, it has the nicer one. It has the XX1. I don't know what they call it. XO. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, the better one. But um, but yeah, I have friends who, you know, they tried the GX Axis Group and they ended up like within just weeks putting it on all their bikes. They're just like, well, oh, wow. this is way better. Um, and there was mm -hmm. a sale on it like a couple months back, so that helped. Yeah. But um yeah it's it's pretty clear that that's the way things are going and and it's it's probably there's there's good reason for it um and actually we were kind of joking about this this ties in with another really popular response um not so much in the survey it was number four but lots of people mentioned it in their comments uh internal cable routing is a pain to a lot of people a lot of people don't see the utility in that and you know, it's funny because electronic shifting, especially wireless, like gets rid of that. So, so if you hate internal right. shifting, then, then you should, or internal cable routing, then you should like electronic shifting. Yeah. Kind of a, uh, pretty funny opposing points. Um, <laughs> another like interesting point on electronic drivetrains is the electric version is actually way, um, a decent amount more like a, a amount worth noting over the mechanical uh which makes sense because batteries are heavier but you're actually mm -hmm. adding some weight when you switch mm -hmm. to an axis drivetrain yeah yeah though i wouldn't make the battery any smaller i mean it's actually a big yeah. battery it's surprisingly <laughs> large but yeah i found you don't have to charge it that's what people worry about and so i think they were like mm -hmm. all right we're gonna put a battery on here that's gonna last and you don't have to don't have to worry about it so yeah Definitely one of those. If you haven't tried it yet, don't knock it till you try it, and then then maybe come up with an opinion about it. So number three on the list was flip chips, and we had also run a survey about flip chips, asking people um, that had them, like how often they use them and stuff. So about fifteen percent of people in this survey said that they thought uh, flip chips are the least useful innovation in mountain biking what do you think matt do you you like flip chips no not really um <laughs> i thought they sounded kind of cool when they first became a thing but mm -hmm. i mean really what i find is because we get a lot of bikes to test with flip chips and occasionally i'll mess with it and it's it's always the bike always feels better in its most neutral setting, mm, like the stock yeah. setting, which is usually low. Mm -hmm. um, I guess if I was, you know, maybe in like the Midwest or, or somewhere with like really tight trails where I had to turn and maneuver a lot more, maybe I'd put more bikes in a high setting um, mm -hmm. and steepen it up a little bit. But I just, in my experience, I've always found that uh, the bike feels best in its stock neutral setting. Mm yeah um yeah i don't know I had, have you tried many flip chips 
Yeah, I mean, I'm same as you. Like, I I tend to prefer them in whatever position they're in when they're shipped, mm -hmm. like the one that the manufacturer recommends. And, you know, I, I hadn't really thought about it. I mean, they're marketed as like, oh, you can like flip it and it's really easy to do. And so that kind of implies like you're supposed to do it like, oh, I'm going to ride in the mountains today and tomorrow I'm going to ride somewhere else and I'm going to flip my chip. Um, but, you know, in reality, what we found from that other survey was that um, like 60 percent of people whose bike had a flip chip um, never flip it. They've never even tried it since they bought it, yeah. um, which I guess, you know, kind of lines up with our experience. And then um, and then another like. 17 percent flip it maybe once a year uh, or twice a year so mm. again like it's not it doesn't seem to be it kind of supports the idea that it's not super useful i think it probably is useful like you said um maybe from the manufacturer's perspective or even like a local bike shop where you know the bike can be tuned for like an area of the country or something right so they can sell one bike but like kind of tailor it to different terrain depending what market they're in or or even yeah ideally your bike shop could be like okay like what kind of riding do you like to do we'll get the bike you know your new bike all set up for you and and it'll be just right so yeah that's that's always been my opinion is that they're more of a selling point for bikes and that mm -hmm. it's a huge commitment to think about selling four or five, six thousand dollars on a bike. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh my gosh, well, this other one that I'm looking at has this geometry, but the one I really want has this geometry, but it has a flip chip. So if I don't like the geometry, I can adjust it a little <laughs> bit. Um, yeah. yeah, I really see them as a selling point. And I remember buying a, a bike, um, this was 2016 maybe, and it had four different settings and came in the stock one i was like all right this feels pretty good i'm going to try all these other ones that the manufacturer <laughs> says you know make it suitable for other uh purposes or whatever so put it in mm -hmm. the long and slack setting and the suspension was just pure mush like it just plowed through its travel <laughs> felt unwieldy put it in another se uh, setting that said, oh, this is better for like smooth trails and pump tracks. And it felt harsh and just awful. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the other one, I, yeah, I just stopped trying it at that point. <laughs> Went back to the stock <laughs> setting and never touched it again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's almost, it's like, right. It's a marketing thing and it takes the risk, I think for some people out of a bike purchase because it is yeah. hard to know like what you're going to get and like, am I going to like this? And it's kind of like, okay, well it has a flip chip. So if you don't, like it there's some stuff you can do to maybe you know dial it in more um and also to be clear i mean i think flip chips can be really useful if you've got a bike where um you can set it up with different wheel sizes and so you know people have been doing that for a while kind of on their own you know they'll buy a 29er and then mullet it or you know maybe they yep. want to do smaller wheels and of course you can do that, but it changes the geometry and the kinematics. And so in the situation where like a flip chip is designed to like compensate for that, I think it makes a lot of sense, but, but then you get back to like, well, are many people doing that, like mulleting their bikes and changing wheel sizes. And if that's the case, like, why not just make the bike like that? So yeah, <laughs> it's a toss up. Correct. Is it useful yeah. or not? Totally. Yep. I, yeah, I agree with the point about, um, you know, converting it to a mixed wheel or something like that, having that setting to, um, mm -hmm. accommodate the change in that intent seems, um, seems a little bit more useful. Yeah. All right. So number four, for those keeping track at home of the least useful mountain bike innovations, uh, internal cable routing. And to be honest, like that was my choice. Um, that was kind of the idea I had for the survey was just like, oh, I, you know, I've seen a lot of people kind of complaining about it and mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan myself. So yeah, that was my top choice. What do you think about internal cable routing, Matt? Yeah, I'm, I'm mixed on it. I do like a cleaner aesthetic. Um, and I definitely mm -hmm. understand the point of, you know, you spend a bunch of money on a carbon bike and it looks sick and, and then you have all these cables dangling from it or zip tied to the frame <laughs> or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And then the complicated factor of you and I, when we're doing break reviews or something like that, like it's yeah. definitely the worst part of dealing with uh, <laughs> internal cable routing. Everything else is, you know, it's not that bad, even ship cables or chopper cables. Mm -hmm. um, but having to cut off the tip of a new break and then insert it and drag all this <laughs> brake fluid through your new um, frame. Yeah, it, it makes things messier. Uh, yeah. and, and I'll say like there's good and bad cable routing of mess with bikes that have an easier design to work with and ones that are more complicated to work with. So mm -hmm. I guess it depends on the bike. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And I mean, with this one too, for me, it just comes, I guess, comes back to the word useful. Like I totally agree that it, it looks good, but I don't know if looks mm -hmm. are, is like a utility. I mean, it's the opposite, I guess, right? <laughs> like aesthetics and utility. Totally are kind of two different concepts. So from that perspective, to me, it's, it's not useful, but I do understand like why it exists and that for a lot of people, it is a nice feature that they like to have. And, um, yeah, I was thinking about that, like with some gravel bikes, I just, um, taped a set of bars for the first time on, you know, gravel bike. And mm -hmm. I was just thinking like, Oh yeah, like this is, this is kind of neat because it like, you get all your cables underneath it, like looks really good. And yeah, I, I can get why people want to bring that into mountain biking, that idea of like really sleek looking cockpit and setup and everything. I think maybe people are getting tired of it though, in terms of like the latest stuff. Cause we did the easy stuff, like routing things through the down tube and seat tubes and stuff like that. Now we're getting into like, how about through the head tube or like, what about the bars? We could route it through the bar and then the stem and then the, like, yeah, that stuff starts, starts getting pretty, pretty rough. And you can definitely hear uh, roars from commenters and, and things that they don't really like the way that uh, brands are going with headset cable routing. Right. Um, again, it seems like another way for brands to make a cleaner looking bike and mm -hmm. I guess maybe even ditch cable ports on the frame itself. Mm -hmm. Um, if there's enough room in the head to or head tube to route cables through, mm -hmm. but again, how much easier is that going to make someone's life when they're trying to swap a cable or housing or install a new part? Right. For sure. Yeah. It's funny too. Cause we are, I probably mentioned it in another show. We're kind of like in between times where you know, wireless shifting is coming on strong. And yet these frames are still coming with all these ports in them, like left side, right side, like, you know, one for the brake and one for the derailleur and one for the dropper post. But, you know, if you're running a wireless dropper and a wireless drivetrain, you got these like open holes in your frame that you now got to plug. And, and now those are ugly. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe in a few years it'll disappear entirely because we're, we're just all wireless yeah it i think like like you and i were talking about um tires the other day and and the quest to find a new material to make a tire out of and to use less rubber and mm. it seems like one of those components that can really only be improved upon up to a certain point and i wonder how much that applies to the bike in general to where mm. um Sure, we can get to electronic drivetrains and ditch cables and, and things like that. But one, we don't need to um, to make a bike as good as it can be. Mm -hmm. There's really not much of a performance upgrade by adding electronic shifting um, aside from shifting that is like microseconds quicker. <laughs> right. And uh, I mean, I guess engineers are out of the job if they don't try to continually <laughs> look for innovation. But at the same time, I think bikes will continue to evolve, but when it comes down to drivetrain cables and, and brakes, brake cables, uh, hydraulic systems, especially, I don't know how much more improvement you can really find in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So the next choices, I'm going to lump these next two together just because they're weird and like, I'll own it. I put these choices in there, not really thinking about them, just knowing that these are things that people complain about and were mad about at the time that they came out. But, uh, mm -hmm. the next one was boost and super boost. So like this, 
spacing, rear wheel spacing that we have on mountain bikes. Pretty much every bike now is is boost at least. And then, you mm -hmm. know, a few of them are super boost. And then hip packs too, which I don't know. I just know people love to hate hip packs and <laughs> make fun <laughs> of them. So I wanted to see how many people, um, yeah, didn't don't like hip packs. But I don't know. What are your thoughts on, on boost? I mean, it seems like boost, you know, it was painful and kind of a, a hassle to like have to get new wheels and frames and everything. But, but in the end, I, I feel like we gained something with our drivetrains, right? What's, what's your thoughts? Yeah. Drivetrains and geometry for the rear. And I, I guess the overall like stiffness and design of a frame, mm -hmm. um, like you said, I mean, it's, was kind of a painful switch, I guess, less painful if you're trying to carry a frame over from, um, or parts over from an old frame to a new frame. But mm -hmm. in, I think a lot of people's cases like mine, where I sold a bike that had non boost and then just bought a bike that had boost. And I think that's how most people are buying bikes too. They get rid of their bike entirely and get something new. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a less painful switch. It, it, it's definitely deterred me from going super boost because it's like everything I have now has, has boost and mm -hmm. then to buy a super boost frame that it's like, all right, well now I've got to <laughs> at least get a new rear hub and get the rear wheel relaced. Um, right. Yeah. It's like a bummer to me that we didn't just jump to super boost. <laughs> like, yeah. what, what was the point? Like if we're going to make this switch, let's like make a big switch and be done with it and not have to right. revisit it. And now it's only a select, a few companies that are even using super boost. Right. Yep. Yeah. And maybe that one too, a lot of people were keying on, on the super boost side of that, you know, I kind of lumped the two together. And so I, I imagine most of the people were talking about super boost, not being useful enough for them to make the switch there. So yeah, I mentioned hip packs. I probably should have lumped this with the next, next one. So what are we at? One, two, three, four, all right. Hip packs was number six <laughs> and then number seven, uh, the least useful innovation was stash tools and in frame storage. And Matt, you actually recently wrote a piece, an opinion piece saying that in frame storage was like a really big deal and something that you're a big fan of. Right. So yeah. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Um, and that hip packs are still, relatively new, at least like within the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and that helped people get away from riding with a full pack. And now I think in frame storage, um, cargo boxes, glove boxes, uh, swap, box, whatever people are calling it, um, mm -hmm. is going to help more people get away from riding with a hip pack. Mm -hmm. Um, and especially if you combine that with, uh, the next one on the list, the bottle cage, it's like, you don't, have to take a pack out at all. If you're going on a ride, that's not that long or whatever you, mm -hmm. you feel like you just don't need it. Um, but my argument was that it's, I still have friends that carry full hip pack or full hydration packs on short rides, like hour long rides. I'm like, why do you yeah. need all that stuff? <laughs> um, because mountain biking is such an athletic, uh, activity. Mm -hmm. And I mean, would you go to the gym and like, I guess some people do, would you go to the gym with a 15 pound pack on and try and do lunges <laughs> and all this other stuff? I don't know. I wouldn't. Yeah. No. Um, and in frame storage, I think helps get away from that and enhances athletic movement and ability. So that was my argument. I like yeah. it. Yep. For sure. Yeah. You're right. All three of those, um, for me are, are very useful. Um, hip packs, for sure, we're, we're a good step away from backpacks. For me personally, felt a lot better to ride, um, especially here when it's hot. Like it's just so much cooler to not have a backpack on. Um, but mm -hmm. then, yeah, in the last two years or so, I've been able to get away from hip packs entirely, and I don't own a bike with in-frame storage. Um, but you know, what I've been able to do is like, just get a frame bag or a bar bag or a seat post bag. Yeah. I mean, there's all these solutions that you can attach stuff to your bike. And for me, that's, that's huge. That feels so much better to ride without anything on my person. 
let the bike carry it. You know, people, some people make really good points that like seat bags and stuff, they're not ideal. Like they're going to kind of not be secure and they're going to flop around if you don't have the right one. And, you know, so for me, in frame storage is, is a great way to fix that. Um, but yeah, it is something that like not everybody has access to yet. Um, you know, still kind of found on like the more premium bikes, but for me, yeah, getting, yeah. getting some kind of bag on your frame is a really good, like alternative to that. Yeah. I, and I wonder like how applicable the in-frame storage is going to be to aluminum bikes. Um, mm -hmm. it, the yeah, most... Trek has that on, on one of theirs, I think. They do. Okay. Yeah. And maybe Komen Sol or somebody. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's possible. I know that, that it has been done, but you're right. It's not that common, um, especially because the, just the tubes aren't as big generally, or they don't need to be mm -hmm. as big. So not as much space, but, but for stash tools, I mean, everybody's got room for stash tools and that's an easy like aftermarket yeah. thing where you can get like, you know, Put something in your handlebars get a tool in there or you know in your in your uh steer tube you know i've got the one up system there so yeah and bottle cages you know there's all kinds of stuff you can attach to the bottle cage so you can like clip a mini pump on there or you can put a tool on there so yeah lots of options which which is nice yeah it, it does look actually like the latest stump jumper evo alloy does have a swap box um but okay. so it can be done but is it uh is it practical for every you know especially right. smaller brands to implement it who might not have the resources or scale that specialized does i don't know yeah yep yeah and still for me too like you can only put so much in your frame i mean especially right. like yeah. when i do rides in the winter like i love having the full frame bag like a full front triangle bag that i can fit like an extra layer and you know oh, yeah. you're talking about serious stuff like a jacket like a insulated jacket that you're not going to fit inside your frame so yeah for that reason i can see if people are like that's not that useful to me because i need to carry a lot of stuff then mm -hmm. yeah i can see that definitely all right, so uh, one of the like ringer choices that I put in there was dropper posts because I'm a big fan of dropper posts and I was just curious, like, would anybody pick this as not useful? <laughs> I mean, I think I've written an article at least once uh, saying that the dropper post is like the biggest innovation in mountain biking in you know, at least the last 20 years. Um, but yeah, somehow 3% of people, so like 250 people at last check, had said that dropper posts were not useful. What do you make of that, Matt? Are these people just like, are they just trolling us? Or do you think some people, they really don't need mm. one? Yeah, I don't know. I think maybe they're out <laughs> of the loop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if it's a case of just... You know, maybe there are certain riding styles or, or places people are riding. You know, I mean, if you're riding your mountain bike on the road and just do it for fitness, then I guess I could see you don't need a dropper post. But right. other than that, I feel like you're just you're just fooling yourself. Yeah, there's not many good arguments uh, for not having a dropper post anymore, um, yeah. aside you know, if you're a professional cross country world cup racer and are really looking to save that like two or 300 grams or <laughs> whatever the lightest dropper post is now, but. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of, of saving weight, um, that was the least popular choice. So this is confusing because it's like a double negative, but <laughs> least useful is weight savings. So that means that people tend to think that weight savings are a reasonable thing to do or a helpful thing um, to do, which kind of runs counter to like the overall trend we've seen over the last many years. And again, I think, I think you've written an opinion piece about that, about how mm -hmm. bike weights and component weights, like just aren't a big factor for a lot of people anymore. Are you surprised then that, that so few people um, 
said that weight savings weren't important? I don't know. Um, I guess maybe we don't think about it as much as we used to, mm, yeah. um, which is was kind of the pillar of my article uh, before my opinion in that like the bike I have right now um, is a perfect example of that because it weighs 36 pounds and it's mm -hmm. freaking heavy. It's a lot to pedal uphill, <laughs> but it's also got great geometry for pedaling and the suspension kinematics are very efficient. So <clears throat> although it's heavy, I like that added weight on the downhill and because it has good geometry, because it pedals well uphill, I'm less concerned about that 36 pounds. I would mm -hmm. like it to be like 32 or 33. That would be awesome. But right. uh, at the same time, it's a less of a concern to me mm -hmm. than like if I had a bike from 10 years ago and it was cramped and like leaning off the cramped in the cockpit and leaning off the back end of the bike and then trying to like pedal 36 pounds uphill. That would be awful. Yeah. Yep. That makes sense. And I mean, by nature, bikes like weight has to be a consideration, you know, I mean, it's not a motorcycle, mm -hmm. it's not a car where you can just be like, well, you know, so what if it weighs a little more, we'll just like make the engine more powerful or we'll, you know, compensate for that some other way. I mean, it's a bicycle, it's human powered, uh, you know, minus e-bikes, which are, which are hybrid of both. But yeah, I mean, for the most part, it's a human powered thing. And so the weight is always going to be a design consideration and, and there are definite limits on that in terms of materials that you can use and the design and, and all of that. So I think, I think most of us realize that that has to be part of the conversation, even if we're not like hyper-focused on it and they're like, you know, weight weenies that will pay like 10 times as much for a part that weighs five grams less, you know? Yeah. I think that's like one of the most fascinating things about bike technology too. Um, did you see that show on Disney uh, or Disney plus with Jeff Goldblum? I forget the name of it. It's like the, oh, world no, I didn't. the Jeff Goldblum or something like that. He does a, an episode on bicycles and um, where he goes and visits the specialized headquarters. And it's, I think like for us, or at least for me, because we're inundated with bike information all the time, it's hard to see the forest through the trees, but hmm. One of the ways that he explains to Jeff Goldblum about um, bikes and, and something you think about when you explain to somebody who's not a rider how much uh, a good mountain bike costs when you tell them it costs four or five grand or whatever, mm -hmm. they're like, oh my gosh, for a, a bike? Like, are you kidding me? And <laughs> to the point that you made is that, you know, you're trying to design this machine that is not powered by a motor. It's powered by our own legs mm -hmm. and it has to be efficient enough and light enough to go uphill and then durable enough to survive everything that goes downhill. It's actually still like a monumental task to hmm. engineer a good mountain bike. Um, so which weight is a huge factor in yeah, and, and will continue to be just because we uh, humans, like we want the easiest path possible. And <laughs> when you have less weight, that's an easier path. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the way you described it, I got to watch that now. It sounds fascinating. I mean, right. The bike is almost an extension of our bodies at, at that point, you know, while it's still completely human powered, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like a, like an implant or something. Right. And we know that it, like a medical device, that's going to be expensive because it's gotta, you know, it's gotta be comfortable and it's gotta be durable and it's gotta like perform. And yeah, it's pretty amazing what we can do with just human power on a bike, like how fast we can go, how far we can ride. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's pretty awesome. Cool. So there were a few items that I did not include as choices on the survey uh, that people mentioned in the comments that I was like kicking myself. Cause I was like, oh yeah, that's a really <laughs> good one. Um, but the, the biggest one for me and the one I might change my vote to from internal cable routing uh, is to steering stabilizers and limiters. You know, yeah. the first one that comes to mind was Trex knock block, uh, which mm -hmm. kind of limited, you know, your, your steering radius. So you don't accidentally hit the bars or the, I think theirs was actually the stanchions into your frame. 
Um, but others have since come around so you don't hit your bars into your top tube or um, uh, who is it? Is it Canyon has the new KISS, KIS yeah. system that's like a, a stabilizer so that, you know, the bike kind of like returns to, to center, you know, almost like your car. Like if you take your hands off the wheel in the car, like it automatically straightens them out again. Um, and so, yeah, this stuff is coming to bikes. There's a number of different variations on it, but I personally hate it. Like I hate how that stuff feels <laughs> right and to me. It's not just like not useful. It's like annoying. So I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on steering stuff? Well, I just realized how ironic the KISS acronym is for this device. Cause it's always stood <laughs> to me as keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. And it's again, I mean, it sounded, I don't know. We didn't get invited to the media camp, so I wouldn't know, but <laughs> adding this device for the sake of stability and then complicating the bike even further and then calling it uh, an acronym that is related to keeping things simple is uh, <laughs> it's amusing to me. Yeah. Um, and, and something that like off the, I, did read some of the reviews out there of people who went and it sounded like it was at least like people found some value in it. But again, I definitely would not buy a bike because of it. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think it's also speaks like the, I guess, engineering philosophy of like anytime you add more features, you add something else that can go wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so now on top of it, maybe the maintenance and um yeah maybe the maintenance of the component isn't all that complicated but you also add another element to the bike that mm -hmm. has to be considered uh, when it comes to maintenance right yeah right and that's kind of a theme with a lot of these choices is these are things that are like i mean i guess the way best way to say it is they are complicating things that bikes have always done and you know people are trying to make bikes better but um for a, a lot of folks you know that's that's what we love about bikes is that they're simple and so we're gonna push back on certain things that are like well that's nice but it's not nice enough that we want to like mess with this thing that is pretty well designed and has been refined over many years and yeah it, it would be really fascinating to well, for one to try kiss, I haven't, haven't tried it, um, to be mm -hmm. fully transparent, but, um, yeah, just to hear some of those arguments because man, some of the worst feelings on the bike that I've had are like riding in, you know, like really thick sod grass where like, you just feel <laughs> like you can't, you can't corner or turn or do anything. Cause there's this like right. resistance to it. And, uh, it's just icky to me. So I don't understand it, but you know, again, there's different use cases. I mean, I think part of the marketing with that is maybe it's, it's helpful for newer riders, folks who are not quite as confident in terms, confident in terms of balance. I don't know. Is that, is that your understanding or is it something that's like really performance oriented? I think the reasons that I heard, um, are, like high speed wheel deflections. Like if you're going fast mm. down a trail and hit a rock and um, I think everyone's probably experienced that where it feels like your front wheel wants to jerk to the side. Mm -hmm. And that's an awful feeling too. Um, and maybe it is for, it comes down to the rider who doesn't know suspension well enough or tire pressure well enough to think about that. When, mm -hmm. when I have that, it usually comes down to like suspension settings. Mm -hmm that's usually at least like what I blame that deflection on maybe yeah. my suspensions off low speed compressions off or something like that. But maybe it's for people who aren't really thinking about that. Yeah. Okay. That makes that, that does make a little more sense. So yeah. TBD. I never say never. Yeah. I always, <laughs> right. You know, that's what I love about this job is, yeah, we get to try stuff and learn new things. And so, yeah, we'll see. Um, Somebody else mentioned 20 millimeter through axles. So mm. um, that one surprised me just because, well, it's not a new thing. I mean, those have been around for a long time. Do you, have you seen much of a push for that? Or like, when's the last time you tested a fork with a 20 millimeter axle? Well, I think 
for a while to refresh myself too. I remember the first, my first full suspension mountain bike was a Rocky Mountain Slayer from like 2011 and that mm -hmm. had a 20 millimeter axle. And I think for, um, and it, it was just up front, it was just in the fork. Right. And I think for a while there was like a push to go to 20 mil up front mm -hmm. and then they just faded away with, with boost and people found they could st stick with 15 millimeter and it would be fine. Um, yeah. I think there was like a little push for a while and then it faded away to 15 millimeter. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, this person was right. It's not that useful. Like the market has decided because right. yeah, yeah I, I mean, I had a, I mean, I guess you would call it a cross country type fork. Yeah. Like 10, 12 years ago that had a 20 millimeter axle on mm. it, um, which was kind of a new thing at the time. Maybe, maybe we would have called that trail uh, back then, you know, it was like more aggressive cross country and that, you know, the axle was part of that. Like, Hey, we got this bigger axle that, you know, normally is only on like downhill bikes, but we're putting it on a, a shorter travel fork. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, I mean, it didn't feel any stiffer. I mean, I couldn't tell the difference between 15 and 20 millimeters and yeah, it just made a hassle like getting wheels and, you know, fork mounts for your yeah i had one of those dumb roof racks where you needed like a adapter oh, right. thing just to put your uh, through axle bike on the roof of the car and so yeah not useful enough to justify all the problems with that so yeah i'm with you commenter 20 millimeter axles not that <laughs> yeah it, it does feel like we're at a point now where the axles and the spacing has settled on either boost or super boost and then even mm -hmm. super boost like really only complicates it one step further for a smaller portion of the riding population so yeah i guess that's nice <laughs> yeah um so one other uh, comment that i thought was interesting was uh from someone who calls themselves tin can hobo i thought <laughs> i'd mention that screen name it's, it's an good user name yeah. Um, he wrote skid turns and anything Red Bull. Okay. Some things Red Bull, it's complicated. So mm. what do you make of that, Matt? Well, I wouldn't call either one an innovation, <laughs> um, but I maybe skid turns or drifting are something that's more practice now. I don't know. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like, maybe they just don't like uh free ride or aggressive riding i don't know right yeah it's interesting because i i'm i get i like the second part of the you know i don't like red bull but uh, <laughs> i kind of do like right <laughs> it's like it, I, that's not my scene i don't i don't ride like that i don't i don't really yeah. know many any people who ride like that um but at the same time yeah i can't not watch it i mean it's pretty it's pretty awesome to see. Yeah. And I, I like, I guess Red Bull always has that stigma, stigmatization of being really heavy and downhill or free ride oriented, but they also sponsor a lot of enduro riders and mm, yeah. cross country world cup riders and definitely do a lot for the sport, I believe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I guess a lot of times too, you hear people use Red Bull as kind of a stand in for this, like, really aggressive mm -hmm. riding culture. I mean, yeah, free ride for me, not even downhill is what I associate, yeah. you know, when I hear someone say that, I assume they're talking about like Red Bull Rampage and, um, right. Yeah. It's complicated because it, it does do a lot for the sport. And then at the same time, it's like, yeah, maybe people have the wrong idea about what the sport is or, you know, what people are doing out there. But yeah, I thought that was a funny one. It, it gets some humor points for sure. <laughs> so was there anything that you thought that we left off the list? Anything that you're mm. just not, not a big fan of? I think people would take point with tire inserts. Mm, that's a good one. Yeah. Should have included that. Yeah. I, I feel like people are pretty divided over them. People either mm -hmm. love them or they just don't need them or they don't like them. And I mean, for me, I fall into the latter. I'm 
usually not writing that hard to where I need an insert, although mm -hmm. I've definitely busted rims before. Um, and I see the, the point in them, um, yeah. but still adds quite a bit of weight and still a huge hassle to install. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I would, I would put those in the category of not that useful for me, but I think they're useful, right? Like for, mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Um, cause yeah, like, yeah, I tested them. I mean, I was excited about them when they came out cause I was like, wow, yes, I have this problem. You know, I get flat tires and I hate, I think most of us, we hate like bottoming out on a rim. That's like the worst feeling yeah. during a ride to like hear that clunk and you're just like, oh no, did I flat? Right. And the, the whole rest of the ride, you didn't flat the whole rest of the ride. You're like dialing it way down. Cause you're like, I do not want to flat, but uh, yeah. But yeah, so I can I can see, yeah, I got excited about them initially, and really I still see the utility in it. But for me, the hassle and the weight just wasn't worth it. And you know, I'd rather just add a couple psi to my rear tire pressure. You know, if I'm bottoming out too much, and and then otherwise just try to ride a flow a little bit better on the trail. I don't know. Like I feel like your riding style can can kind of compensate as well sure yeah or have your casing tire which yep adds weight but also adds a little bit more robustness and maybe you don't need an insert right yeah yeah those things they're not cheap too i mean especially mm -hmm. for what they are so right there's like cost involved and hassle yeah it's easier to just throw a, a big burly tire on there air it up so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah if you can get by really that way one. Yep. Yeah, other than that, I'm not sure. Hmm. Yeah, well, so one that, you know, I've thought about before is, um, and this is like maybe falls into the aesthetic category, but um, I like glossy paint on bikes. And I feel like it's mm -hmm. useful mm -hmm. because it's just easier to keep bikes clean, you know, like to like, I don't know, especially when you got dirt and stuff, if you have like a matte finish, which has been popular for a while, matte paint jobs on bikes, um, yeah. it's just harder to keep them clean. Like you get grit and stuff that stays on them. So it's like kind of a, right. I think it's a useful thing to have a, a nice glossy finish on the frame. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. My gravel bike has a matte finish and when it's fresh out of a, a bike wash, I think it looks awesome. And then I go for a ride and I'm like spilling all my drink fluid, like yeah. all over the top tube. And it's <laughs> just, you're right. Not just dirt. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, you know, we've, we've got quite a list here of things that are questionable in terms of their utility. Um, and some of us find some things more useful than others. And, you know, I'm sure that there will be more things that come out this year and in the years to come that, you know, we'll be debating, are they useful or not? And yeah, well, I guess we'll see what happens. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, we'll start to get press releases and media camps and stuff like that in a couple months when spring rolls around. And it's, I mean, the past couple of years we've been tracking, like what are the big innovations or, or tech trends of the year? And I'm sure this year will bring a whole other uh, set of innovations and mm -hmm. maybe some of them will be good and some will be not as good. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess too, the, this is a very like logical conversation in terms of like, is it useful or is it not? But at the end of the day, mountain bikes too are, they're fun. They're exciting. You know, like <laughs> the yeah. proper measure of a lot of these features is, are they fun? Are they exciting? Does it feel good? Does it look good? And so, yeah, we, we do need to mention that it's not all about utility. Some of these things, yeah, they're totally not useful, but man, they make the sport even more fun. Yeah. Yeah. Or they make your really expensive future new bike look better. <laughs> Right. Exactly. So yeah, this has been a fun conversation and we hope you enjoyed it. If you didn't get a chance to contribute to this survey that was on the website, we're going to have the same survey right here on the podcast. So listeners can weigh in as well and 
looking forward to hear what you think about this topic. That's all we've got this week. We'll talk to you again next week.